Right then, it does look increasingly likely that Sir Jim Radcliffe's bid to own 25% of Manchester United is about to go through. His involvement with football already is quite well known because of his owning niece, and that should have taught him the basics of owning a football club. But Manchester United are no ordinary football club. We are fundamentally broken. We are... I don't even know if you could say a sleeping giant. We're an injured giant. Uh, and we we risk breaking down every single day. Um, and a rebuild is badly needed. And it isn't just a rebuilding of the squad that's on the pitch. Because that gives you a finite lifespan. There needs to be an overhaul of thinking. There needs to be an overhaul of working. And there needs to be an over, overhaul of the methodologies that exist within the football club. One of the reasons Sir Alex Ferguson was enabled to be successful and why chairman at the time, Martin Edwards, says he was in no mind to get rid of him in 19, um, 1990 prior to that FA Cup win, um, when the tabloids were gunning for him and the bedsheets were out saying, Tara Fergie. He was in no mind to get rid of him because he'd seen the structural overhaul in the back end of the football club. He'd seen the scouting overhauling. He'd seen the youth system overhauling. And he believed in what Sir Alex Ferguson was trying to do and the way he was trying to do it. So it's that that needs to happen. It isn't just a, can we get a new centre-half and can we have a new winger? It's not about that. It's about a club that actually has a desire to be the best. You know, the likes of Leicester, overtaken us with their philosophy in their training ground the likes of Brighton have overtaken us with their philosophy in recruitment Manchester City have overtaken us in terms of their overall thinking about everything because they have an owner in place that wants us to be the best in class uh, or wants them to be the best in class and we need one that wants us to be the best in class now the positive news is that there does appear to be a pathway for the Glazers departing and that process, while not being entirely inevitable, and the fact that they've not gone yet, that process could start soon. And we're not privy to the entire details of the, the contract between Jim Radcliffe, Ineos, the Glazers, the shareholders, but I'm sure those things will come out. I think we're going to have a, a quick look at five things that Jim Radcliffe needs to fix at the football club. Right, lads, listen. One of the reasons that I keep a full beard at the moment is because back in the army days, I had to wet shave every single day. Every single day. And it gets old quickly. And it gets boring quickly. But you know what? Manscaped, if this was available back in the day, might have been happy days with it. And Manscaped, your trusted below the waist groomers, have come up with something that is revolutionary for above the neck game as well. They've gone above and beyond with the new Handyman Electric Face Shaver, designed to give you that smooth, chiseled look for a clean shave without the faff of the traditional wet shave. Pop over at manscaped.com, snatch yours, you're going to get 20% off plus free shipping by using the code HOUSE20. Listen, your mug is the first thing that people spot, right? So make sure it's something to see when you get the handyman shaver. Take it from me, someone that cherishes their beard, this is a game changer. It can tackle up three days of growth like a pro. It's got the skin safe technology, so you're going to stay clear of all the nicks and cuts, giving you the confidence to really go for a close shave. It's a go anywhere thing, perfect for wet and dry use. It's not going to let you down on the road because it's compact. It's got a long lasting battery. And if you've got a main like mine, they've also got the Beard Hedger Pro. That's a one-stop shop for beards, all your different needs. It's got a trimmer, it's got 20 different lengths, all on one guard. So say goodbye to clutter, say hello to easy grooming. Now listen, I've got a little challenge for you guys here. If 250 of you get this handyman, screenshot me your order and tweet me with it, I will shave off this glorious beard of mine. That is my challenge to you lot. If 250 of you do it, I will go clean shaven, but I want to see those receipts from you as well. So hurry up, head to manscaped.com, use the code HOUSE20, get 20% off and free shipping, and let's see if the handyman can tempt me back into the clean shaven club. In at number one then, and the first and most important thing to me is we clear the debt. I think that will be a long process, especially with him being a relatively minor shareholder. Uh, the, the biggest single shareholder, but in the grand scheme of things, a relatively minor shareholder. 
But the thing that Radcliffe has to think about is the amount of debt and how it impacts us as a footballing institution. I can't stress enough just how much this debt has dragged Manchester United down since the Glazers took over. They took out a £660 million loan. They have paid in excess of £1.5 billion back. So you go, wow, took out 660 paid £1.5 billion back. What must we owe, Steve? About 50 mil? 940. <laughs> right. Okay. Was it with Wonga? Like, how did we get to pay three times what they initially had to buy us back and we still own double what we cost? <laughs> Mind-blowing. Now, for all the people who go, well, actually, the debt's manageable and actually, it's a tax write-off and actually, shut your fucking mouth, right, for starters. Because that would have been £100 million every single season since the Glazers bought us in 2005. Now, £100 million is one very good signing right now, but in 2005, that was two world-class players. That was the, the world record fee, twice, back in 2005. And it was only £55 million about a fortnight before Cristiano Ronaldo signed for Real Madrid, all the way in 2009. So even in just those four-year period alone, we could have invested just into world-class players. We could have bought seven or eight genuine world-class players at the top of the market, let alone actually trying to buy you know, the likes of Benzema for what did he go at the time? Was it about £25 million, pounds, something like that? Absolutely ridiculous. But more importantly, what we would have seen is Manchester United continue to improve and invest off the field. We might have not needed to sell Cristiano Ronaldo. And we might have actually added to the team at that point. We might have refreshed Rio and Vidic and Evra and Van der Sar a little bit earlier. We might have done things in a different way. We might have seen our winning streak sustained. We might have invested into a youth stadium. We might have already upgraded Old Trafford. That $1.5 billion that has been extracted from the club to the banks and the Glazers might as well have not existed. And it's your money and my money. As a United fan, if you've ever bought a single piece of merchandise or ever had a single match ticket, that's your money and that's my money. And it's been mismanaged by the owners. And it'll be continue to be mismanaged while it still looms with almost a billion still owing. There is zero sign that we're going to clear that debt. Now, it's obviously not going to happen as quickly as it would have done with Sheikh Jassim, who would have gone, boom, and it's done. And you can't think of, of that any more than if it was just a dream, because it is that. But there has to be a pathway to clear the debt. There has to be a pathway to unshackle the club from this burden that we've had for almost two decades. Because for all the, well, actually, debt's fucking good in business. No, debt's good in business when it's been invested into something that gives you a positive outcome. Spurs debt is good. No one's sitting here going, fucking state of Spurs from a brand new state-of-the-art fucking stadium that might be the best in the country. No one's saying that. They're saying that stadium's unlocked more revenue opportunities and them paying it off will be a good thing. What did we get? We got a new fucking owner. We didn't even get a new fucking lick of paint on the stadium until about 18 months ago. Debt is good when you use it to invest and grow. We didn't use it to invest. We didn't use it to grow. We just got a new owner and they fucking rinsed us, right? The debt has to go. The club needs a clean slate because the club does generate money, but it's hampered. We are fighting with one hand tied behind our back against state-owned clubs. And two, tied to this, United's infrastructure is an absolute disgrace and that much is clear. There seems to be uh, an... Uh, a desire for the the old boys network and to me looking from the outside it just seems very much there's a couple of things at play one is the the book of fergie now i'm not saying you completely throw out the lessons learned by fergie fergie didn't throw out the lessons learned by the likes of sir matt and sir bobby charlton he embraced them but he embraced them with his own ideas 
we just seem that we're just going on the the book of Fergie and not looking to reinvent or or to take the sport any further. And the sport has moved on. From an infrastructure point of view, the fact that we only just recently appointed a director of football is a disgrace. The fact that we only just um, appointed a director of football and his prior role was just somebody inside the academy, rather than us going out and going, who might be the best director of football in the world? That was what literally Manchester City did. They went, who's the best director of football in the world? Barcelona like they're doing a good fucking job, right or wrong. And they went and got him. Manchester United went, who already works here that we can give a different title to? Now, the club have just invested in a building for the women's team. The fact that they're making a big deal out of that is almost embarrassing. That building should have come before you announced that the women's team was back. You should have gone fucking bosh, bosh. There you go. Brand new building, and here's our women's team. Not, let's get a women's team. Let's run it for, what has it been like, 10 years or something like that since they reintroduced the women's team back to Manchester United? They've been playing out of Lee. They've been training out of fucking Porter Cabins. It's an absolute disgrace. They're treated like third-class citizens at the football club. You, you, you have a women's team because it's the right thing to do. Fucking treat them like elite athletes that they are. And you wouldn't see the the absolute fucking talent migration out of Manchester United. United have had some incredible players, some very, very good players down the years in the women's team. And they all eventually leave because we treat them like dicks. You know, including perhaps one of the best managers in the game in Casey Stoney. The stadium's falling apart. You know, it's embarrassing that it wasn't one of the stadiums used for Euro 2028. I, I'm old enough to remember Euro 96. It's a long fucking time ago now. But Euro 96, they renovated the north stand of Manchester United. And actually, the entire stadium was pretty new at the time because they recently converted it from the the majority terracing that it was. Obviously, the entire Stretford end was redone, uh, the back end of the, the 93 season. And by the time it got to... 94 sort of time Old Trafford was this really smart looking bowl basically what South Stand is now all the way around like that bottom tier and it looked fucking mega at the time um because it was actually one of the biggest stadiums in the country at the time like that and then for the for Euro 96 they um boshed on three tiers of the North Stand um and it was a weird experience when you first went into those cantilevered stands because they move. It's quite normal now, especially like I'm on tier two of Stretford End for my season ticket now, and it moves a little bit. But it was so fucking strange at the time because all I'd ever experienced was like locked to the ground, terracing and, and seating, and it didn't fucking move. When you get onto those, it, it moved. But but alas, with Euro 96 came um, the investment required for Manchester United to host. And, and I watched Euro 96 live, uh, I think I watched Germany, Czech Republic and Italy. Uh, I think that was a group and it might have been a quarter final as well. Um, and they were all staged at Old Trafford because Old Trafford was the best stadium in the country at the time. It was better than Wembley, it just wasn't as big. It was it was newer, uh, it was it was a better look to it. Old Trafford was, was so much better than the old Wembley um, in, in many different ways. You fast forward to the next time the Euros comes and what work has been done to Old Trafford? Well, they, they added an extra tier on the top and um, east and west stand, and then they filled the corners in. And that's it. Since Euro 96. <laughs> and actually, that's it since... That's not even it. I mean, since 2004, actually, when the, the plans were afoot to fill in the, the corners, there's been nothing done to Old Trafford. A bit of fucking about with the disabled section, which actually doesn't benefit the disabled people that sit in them. Our disabled fans, our most vulnerable fans that we put under the away fans who throw flares at them and spit at them and, and throw bottles and drinks on them. What fucking football club would allow that? Honestly, it's an absolute disgrace that that's allowed to happen. Put it, make it a bit spicier. Put one of the singing sections right underneath the away end. That would be fucking brilliant. Not our most vulnerable fucking fans. It's ridiculous. The training ground's now vintage. Ronaldo put the boot in when he was leaving, alluded to the fact that everything was exactly the same as when he was first at the fucking club. He first came to the club 20 years ago, by the way. 
if Jim has got the true control that he thinks he's getting from the 25% um, ownership, with what I'm aware of from both him and Sir Dave Brailsford, who, who seems to come up a lot, and I wonder if he'll be consulted and in and amongst all of this lot, there has to be a desire to improve the training facilities. And as well as this, there's a ton of local improvements. If United wants to be taken serious as a football club again, there has to be improvements to Old Trafford's transport uh, links uh, and facilities for things like that. Like There has to be a petition of Manchester Council or whoever the fuck it is that runs the Metrolink. Metrolink, if you want... I should be able to get the tram to the match. That's what it's there for. But they only ever put on two trams. Why is it not a big fucking train? You would, like The tram comes pretty regular, but you can stand there for six trams to come while you're already on the platform waiting to get on a tram because the one that pulls up in front of you, well, that's completely jammed. You're not getting on that one. Okay, what about the next one? Nope, you're not getting on that one as well. The next one that pulls in is a few less people on it from wherever it stopped first. 10% of the people are going to get on. And that happens time and time and time again. And it takes hours to clear out from Old Trafford. Hours. And it, there's been a football stadium there for over 100 years, and this is the best we can fucking do. It's an absolute joke. No wonder they didn't want to host the Euros here. The, the concourses at times feel Victorian. The, the facilities around the ground make you feel unwelcome. I've been to some stadiums around the world, and the amenities around the stadium, and I, look, ultimately, you're there for the football. That happens inside. But there is no desire, it appears to me, from Manchester United to bring the community in. Like, even from a business point of view, you make money as a football club from the megastore and from what goes out on the pitch. But Old Trafford, and obviously the museum, but Old Trafford should just be so much more of an attraction. You shouldn't be able to move with, without falling over a piece of history. I've said it time and time again because it's the sort of thing I would absolutely kill for at Old Trafford. There should be some sort of a, a heritage wall or a success wall uh, that you make. Like, Real Madrid have got that room, haven't they, with all of their European Cups in, right? And it's fucking phenomenal, phenomenal. And I'm jealous, and everybody should be. But that's what you should have. When you sign for Real Madrid, they go, hey, do you fucking understand what you're signing for? Why isn't there a room with seven first divisions and 13 Premier League trophies in it that all new signings have to walk through and see our European Cups and see our FA Cups and all of that. Put them behind bulletproof glass and make it on a fucking attraction at the back of the Stretford end. Make the opposition players have a big mural of every captain that lifted one of our trophies and have the away team walk past it so they know they're in a fucking fight when they get it. Why is there none of that? At the moment, people go to Old Trafford, they take pictures outside the Trinity and outside the green glass on the front. They'll take pictures of the Alex Ferguson thing, and that's it. It's one of the most iconic stadiums in the world. Give people more shit to go look at. Yes, there's the Munich Tunnel. Sometimes that tunnel's closed and, and not accessible. Do something on the back of the Stretford and, and have things that people can fucking see and do around the place. From a pure business perspective, why wouldn't you do that? Surely more people spending more time at Old Trafford means that they're spending more fucking money and that's only a good thing for the club. And then you've got you know, the prestige and intimidation factor of having opposition teams. Think about all the TV cameras show, all the time, players arriving at Old Trafford. Now imagine that walk shows the whole history of trophy winning at United. Come on, man. Number three. This might even be one of the most important, but it's uh, maybe not quite as much as the debt, but it's very, very important. The correct people in place. Now, this is a call that needs to affect every single person employed by Manchester United. It means only the right personnel working for us in, in important roles. Players, extremely important staff members. Potentially one of the most important staff members. Recruitment. It's, it's, it's at least equally important as the players because they're the people that are selecting the players. They're your big investments. They're your big gambles. They're your big risk. You know, the people that are on the board can't be having someone's fucking mate on there. You know, you can't be having people who don't have a fucking clue what they're talking about on there. You can't have unqualified people 
dealing with what's a multi-billion dollar company. You know, especially what, like, you might get away with the occasional idiot or a little bit of nepotism running, I don't know, a printer ink company because, fuck me, what's the metrics of success? Is how much we sell and how much we pay for our printer ink. Cool. That's a very easy market to figure out. Are we doing enough for advertising? Is our product good? Are we getting it at a good price? Do we make money on that price? Jobs are good. Sport doesn't work like that. Sport, you're competing against people that are trying to stop you succeeding. And that requires a different mentality and a level of ruthlessness that shouldn't exist in regular business. And it's a whole different way of operating. United need to see improvement across the board. And I'm not just talking about the board. I'm talking about every single level of the football club. And it's a domino effect. You get the right people involved at board level. They're the the right sort of demanding people that go, no, 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 no. Fourth is not fucking acceptable for this football club. We need to be doing better. And here's the tools to do better. And they will get the right recruitment people in. And they will get the right coaching people in. And they will get the right scouting people in. And they will get the right players coming through the door and the right juniors coming through the door. And it's literally one begets the next. You need the best in class. Manchester United used to feel like the best in class. It no longer feels like the best in class. And this is something I I fucking detest the Glazers for. One of many things. I used to be everything Manchester United. And there is a distaste in your mouth and almost like a guilt about being a Manchester United supporter at the moment. And you see it in the comments. People genuinely believe that match-going fans are a problem. And I obviously can't agree with that. Because ultimately, those match-going fans will be replaced. It happened in 2005 with the initial takeover. Great lads just got replaced. The club doesn't give a fuck. The club does not give a fuck. And it, I want to go back to a time where I, I... I remember growing up, I had the choice of a JVC stereo at home for my ninth birthday... Or a sharp one. Well, what the fuck doesn't... I, there's no fucking Google reviews. When I was nine, at least, anyway. It wasn't even fucking Google. I'm look, I'm I'm probably in, what, a Tandy or a Rumbelows or something, right? And I'm looking at these two stereos for a birthday present. Which one does Steve go with? I go with a sharp one. Because sharp represents Manchester United. And now you, you fast forward to 2023... It was probably about, it probably was nineteen ninety three actually. Thirty years ago, that would have been how it was going down. Now, you almost go out of your way to not support Manchester United sponsors, and that's not a healthy relationship to have with the football club. And the only reason we have that relationship is because of our fucking owners. Like that needs to change entirely. And that leads me to the next point in terms of unity. Now, for far too long, we've been seeing the club bashed in the media for leaks. There's scandals. There's media whirlwinds. There was an element of me that thought that Ed Woodward actually reveled in any news, good or bad, because it was engagement. Um, there was a fucking extremely distasteful thing where they talked about how the, they got engagement on a post about Nobby Styles' illness, which is a fucking joke, by the way. But with Sir Jim's involvement, He has to get everybody on board. And I think he's going to be up against it because there's a large section of the fan base that just wanted that instant sugar hit of a sugar daddy that was going to come in, wipe the debt out, and buy everyone the big shiny things like Mbappe. The reality is Sir Jim's getting involved with the Glazers and potentially enabled them to stay on a little bit longer. And for a lot of fans, that's treacherous and and treasonous and probably going to be unforgivable. So he's, he's against it from the off. But I think he's got a chance if he is allowed to make a statement. And if we believe the fact that the Glazers have saw their ass with um, Sheikh Jassim saying he wanted to restore the club to former glories, then whether or not he'll be even able to make this statement is unknown. But I think if he comes in and he makes a statement appointment like a Paul Mitchell, like a commitment to something, that would be a great start of getting the fan base united again. Because ironically, Manchester United are as disunited as a fan base as it's possible to be. And I think getting everybody all on one campaign together 
would be the best thing that he could do. And again, this is all... I mean, all of this is linked. But number five, fix the spirit. Jim Radcliffe clearly wanted to buy this club for a long time. He's out there in interviews saying, I would, but it's not for sale. I think even his little soiree with trying to buy Chelsea was because that United wasn't an option on the table to him at the time. And while he doesn't have anywhere close to the financial backing the Sheikh Jassim bid appeared to have, he does appear to be, at the very, very least, someone that is a football fan. We know he was at the, the final in 1999. I can't imagine that was the only game that he's attended. Um, he was quite famously known as a Manchester United fan until I think he tried to do probably some ill-advised PR when he was buying Chelsea. I think Chelsea fans probably was, or someone advised him and said, listen, if you're buying Chelsea, you can't be this outspoken United fan. So it was like, oh, well, I lived in London and I thought I'd get a season ticket at the time. I don't believe it. As much as I don't believe that Sheikh Jassim's a fucking died in the wool United fan. I think that was something people did for PR. But I think Sir Jim is a United fan. Obviously, he's from the area. It's 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 not a fucking crazy leap to think he's a United fan, especially when he was um, attending games 25 years ago as a minimum. So I think he's a fan, and I think him being a fan is very important. And the spirit of the club has been dying for a long time. Post Sir Alex and David Gill, there's there's been problems there for the whole world to see. And if the Glazers do actually intend to cede 100% ownership to Jim on, a, on some sort of a roadmap plan, then I think the process to get United back could rely on the spirit of the club being founded again. And I think one thing this club has thrived on in past decades is just trying to be the best. One thing, two things, several things. And we're not the best at anything anymore. Apart from wasting money, maybe. I mean, Chelsea had probably fucking overtook us in that as well. And it hasn't felt for a long time that United want to be the best. It feels like good enough is just enough. Rather than, can we leave a legacy or anything here? Top four is fine. And if it costs us an extra 50 mil to maybe push and win a title, top four is fine. I think involving fans would be a key factor. No one knows the club better than the fans. Um, people on the fans forum get a lot of shit um, I don't know the reason for that but it's a fact and I don't know if that, that could be expanded maybe um, I wouldn't listen to the fans on everything he has to have his own mind and his own convictions but I think he should involve the fans where he can and I hope he gets to prove the doubters wrong because you like it or lump it we're probably going to have him and I think crying over not getting Qatar isn't going to produce anything. So let's hope that Sir Jim is able to start the process of Manchester United remembering who we are. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Hey, thank you for watching the video. If you are new around these parts, then don't forget to subscribe. My channel is proudly supported by my community on Patreon. If you'd like to get a little bit of extra content, a Discord group, meetups, five-a-side games, weekly podcasts, behind the scenes, and even an occasional bit of transfer news as and when I get it, then for the price of a pint, you can show your appreciation for the content that we make and get some goodies for doing so as well. Check the link in the description or click the button right here. You'll also find all of my socials here too if you want to follow me on any of those platforms. Nice one.